Thank you, Danny. Move this out of the way, and maybe run over. There's the new little ward. Got his own blanket there, monogram blanket and box in the bottle. Warren Graham Ford, I don't know what they'll call him. They always call ours be quiet. <laughs> for a little while. Thank the Lord uh, for them and uh, they're, 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 they've got a whole quiver full of children now. So, but uh, continue to pray. Uh, as far as I know, Tiffany is well too. But uh, born on Monday was the 21st. So thank the Lord for them. And as I said, don't forget to pray for Terry. She's under the weather. Terry Ward. Let's go to the next slide there, Clark. Thank you. Uh, been a lot of uh, Christmas box activity this week. I've seen a lot of your texts. Purchases being made, evidently sales being discovered, just outright, and uh, clothing, I think, has been the uh, ticket. Anything you got to say, uh, Andy, today? Anything special or a comment? I appreciate that. everybody's hard work. We, we just got a few more boys outfits to get, and we're done. Mom and Dad have started preparations, so if you go by the mission room, you'll see boxes already beginning to get assembled. So. Okay. Henry and Linda are, they come here when it's quiet and cool and uh, have been assembling our packages in the recent years and are already starting on that. So that's kind of what our mission room, if you haven't been by there, go, it's just a blessing to go by there. And thank you so much for all of your contributions to this. Also, we, there's a, we still have yet to pay our, we pay the shipping charge on this. I guess we could call it postage. That kind of sounds like putting it in an envelope and sending it. But it is, uh, shipping is put on in uh, containers that go on boats and uh, they're shipped down to Honduras through the Amen organization, which is uh, primarily a, a nursing and medical supply ministry uh, that was started here in Alabama. But it, it kind of, uh, churches got involved in this way with the uh, Christmas boxes. So good work. We're working on 200 boxes. We'll have those ready soon. Thank you so much. And uh, keep checking with what we need, and if you see something that we can contribute, let us know. Okay, let's go on to the next slide there. Next Sunday morning, we'll be observing the Lord's Supper in the first part of the, the service. So the entire service will be dedicated to that. Come and worship with us and share with us in the Lord's Supper if you can. Uh, and uh, we are still committed. Uh, we will probably won't do this forever, but uh, for right now, we're uh, still trying to be careful, and especially with things we put in our mouth, <laughs> things that we consume, and so we're using the uh, miracle meals instead of just the uh, tray and the uh, plate of uh, bread for the Lord's Supper, the, our traditional way of observing the Lord's Supper. This is just a way that our very sanitary, make sure to handle these little units. They have, so they're sealed, medically sealed, and they have the wafer in there and the juice, and we don't touch them, no one touches them with our hands. We use gloves. And so we pass that out, and uh, or I'll let you come and get it, so to speak. But uh, we're still observing that protocol, and uh, th that may be uh, an overreaction as well. But we'll continue to do that for a little while in our Lord's Supper observance. Also next Sunday, let's look at the next slide. We're, right after the, we observe the Lord's Supper, we're going to have a brief business meeting. So for those of you who are members, will be we're asking you to express your will on two issues. Uh, the our church treasurer, the wards, and uh, also our deacon body have amended and updated our 2023 church budget. So that's been in circulation. There are copies of it on the entrance table. And it, but it needs, however, if you, I, we've been uh, passing this about and circulating it and promoting it for about a month now. And uh, we'll, we need you to uh, give it a thumbs up or thumbs down next Sunday. Uh, we're not going to be uh, uh, discussing or debating or uh, we're, we're hoping that you have, if you've had any questions that you have already asked them. If you haven't yet, there's still time. There's a week and if you need to ask me a question or our treasurer, you can call Ms. Terry. But if there is some concern or interest that you have about the
the way our uh, church finances are conducted, then uh, this budget drives uh, our, and guides our money expenditure and our financial ministry. So we'll be asking you to do that. Also, I've asked the deacons to let me uh, launch him a, a, uh, an unusual ministry. Uh, we have Sunday school, but uh, recently we uh, our Sunday our Sunday school teacher for the uh, young married couples was called away to serve at a church in uh, Coleman County. So I've asked uh, members of our family, uh, Ty and Bethany Chancellor, to come and lead a brief six-week course called the Life of a Jesus follower just for our young marrieds and they're coming as volunteers it's kind of like bringing someone in for a music ministry or a teaching ministry or a revival as we have done in the past so it's not completely strangely unique but uh, uh, show that next slide there Barbie. this is uh, Ty and Bethany Chancellor they're members of our family and uh, we've watched them grow up and grow together and uh, they're going to be leading this study every Sunday at 10 o'clock during Sunday school, as it is proposed, every Sunday morning in October, and then the first Sunday in November. Six sessions for the young married couples that uh, would be in this age group. If you would, I'd encourage you, you to approve this, since it is an unusual venture. Cast your vote and say, yes, let's try that, let's do that. I hope that you will support this with your vote next Sunday. Uh, the children and the young lady who was here is uh, Bethany's sister, Lacey, and they, she and the kids were here this morning. Might ask you also, uh, we probably should have already done that, but you, I know that if you have uh, met them, you may have also met uh, Lacey's husband, Sean. He is a police officer, and he does a wonderful job. We're very proud to have him in our family. And uh, as well as pray for Shawnee that anybody that does police work um, deserves our extra prayers. But this is Ty and Bethany. Uh, they've been over here with us several days. They had some sick uh, kids, sick children last Sunday. I don't know how they're doing today, but uh, you'll get another chance to meet them. And uh, they're a part of this package that I've been given the opportunity to propose. Let's go on. Now, before we do that, uh, uh, Danny mentioned it as well. The, uh, our Sunday school literature, I believe, for, for the exploring the Bible for our uh, adult Sunday school classes is in today. It's uh, back on the back table. If you didn't get yours during Sunday school, if you, if you, even if you don't attend Sunday school or can't attend Sunday school, please pick up a quarterly. Pick up a lesson book. They're back there on the back pew. And be starting next Sunday, a study of the Gospel of Mark. And if you wish, you can join through my Facebook page every Sunday. We uh, videotape that. It's available to you there. So study. Get your quarterly back there. There's a few large print that are left in regular student books for studying the adult Sunday school lesson. Be sure to, that you pick one up for yourself. Or if you know someone who would enjoy having one, take one too. We're going to be looking at the Gospel of Mark this morning. If you want to turn over there in your Bible, I, I laugh. Turn over your Bible. That kind of creates an unusual uh, image. To Mark's Gospel, chapter 7, we're looking at, I think, is one of the most unusual stories in the ministry of Jesus, about which there is some debate and disagreement, and uh, it is uh, quite unlike most of the other stories that are about our Lord. And, and I've entitled the message, Crumbs Under the Table. Crumbs Under the Table. All right, let's go on then. Let's go to that. Uh, I want to show you, first of all, that this is a map of the New Testament, uh, of, of this area of Israel, some call Palestine, and yet it is showing uh, New Testament cities and towns and locations. It is not a modern map. It doesn't show highways and interstates and so forth. But uh, let me see. Uh, it's been a while since I've used this, but I, we have a laser here on our uh, on our remote. Might turn it off. There it is. A little red dot. And uh, we're, in this passage. 
it's, it says an unusual thing. You know, Jesus, most of his ministry was around the Sea of Galilee there in Capernaum or Bethsaida. Or if we come down a little bit further to, uh, in, to Judah where uh, Jerusalem is right there. And Bethlehem is a little bit farther down. But there's the Sea of Galilee and that's where he walked on the water. Up there a little bit north and west of, uh, of Capernaum was Topka and that's where he fed the thousands. But in this story we're looking at in, Matthew, in Mark's, I'm going to keep on calling it Matthew, I know. In Mark's Gospel chapter 7 and it says that he took his disciples and they went to the region of Tyre, T-Y-R-E, right there. And Sidon, S-I-D-O-N. This is the Mediterranean Sea right here. Now the uh, former capital of Israel is Tel Aviv, and it was right, uh, right along here where Tel Aviv is today. There's Joppa and Caesarea. Herod had a great palace and kind of like a, a royal park there at Caesarea. It's a beautiful place right on the sea coast. But uh, here, Jesus very seldom left this area. There was a time when he went through the area of Samaria. And Samaria was right in here. Right there is Samaria. Uh, but that was it. It says that he went there because it said he had to go through there. And it kind of gave the implication that it was to meet a particular and a specific person. That, uh, that uh, Samaritan woman, we call the woman at the well. But uh, here uh, in Matthew, in Mark's Gospel, it says that he said, let's go up to Tyre and Sidon. Now, every once in a while, the Buell family, they like to go to Tyre and Sidon. As a matter of fact, it hasn't been very long since we all went to Tyre and Sidon together. You know what the, the Buells call it? The beach. The beach. That's what they call Tyre and Sidon. Right there on the shore of the Mediterranean. And I don't know what is there today. I'm almost certain that there are houses to stay in and nice restaurants to eat and that I know that the coast there is beautiful. But it's unusual that uh, Jesus, when they got up, and uh, we're going to read this passage from Mark's Gospel in just a minute, and Jesus said to his disciples, let's go to the beach. Let's go to the beach. And nobody argued at all. Let's look at that. Show that next slide there, Gardner. Mark 7, verses 24 through 27. From there he arose and went to the region of Tyre and Sidon. Now, we're going to come back to this, but Tyre and Sidon was very, very un-Jewish. And it was a very commercial. And uh, it was a place that Jewish people just didn't go to very often. He entered into a house and wanted no one to know it. That sounds uncharacteristic of uh, a Messiah, doesn't it? He entered into a house and wanted no one to know it. But he could not be hidden. For a woman whose young daughter had an unclean spirit heard about him, and she came and fell at his feet. The woman was a Greek, a Syro-Phoenician. Now, you know the country of Syria is in that area. Syria and Phoenicia. There is no Phoenician country. But uh, our alphabet, the, the Phoenicians were great seafaring people, and they are credited with having created our alphabet. A Syro-Phoenician by birth. And she kept asking, it, it, and that is very important. It just says like, sounds like she was being <laughs> aggravating. She kept asking him to cast the demon out of her daughter. But Jesus said to her, let the children be filled first. For it is not good to take the children's bread and throw it 
to the little dogs. Oh, man! <laughs> he says, well, it's not good to take food from the children and throw it on the floor for the little dogs. Jesus said that. Let's look at the next slide. And she answered and said to him, Yes, Lord. Yet even the little dogs under the table eat from the children's crumbs. And then he said to her, For this saying, go your way. The demon has gone out of your daughter. And when she had come to her house, she found the demon gone out and her daughter lying on the bed. Let's go back to that former slide there, Carter. Very good. Let's, let's look at that for just a minute. It sounded very much like Jesus was being cruel or unkind. It sounds like he was being harsh or that he was being unkind in some way. I remember years ago, I, Terry and I went, I had been serving as the uh, youth director at the Show Creek Baptist Church, but I needed to, instead of to become a better youth director, I needed to get some training on being a pastor. So Terry and I moved our church membership to a place where uh, one of my spiritual mentors was pastor. And uh, we went there and became members and volunteers, everything that we could get involved in, so I could, we could both learn, and we did. And uh, I remember he got, uh, my pastor friend, got himself into a little hot water with his congregation. Now let me, let me tell you, when I, when I first met this man is when he invited me to come and preach for their church during there, they had a youth revival event. And I remember that I couldn't even drive. My dad had to take me. It was at the Fifth Avenue Baptist Church. And my dad took me to preach there. And I hadn't been preaching. I was, I was only about 14 years old. I didn't have my driver's license. And my dad never went to church. <laughs> so he was glad to take me to church and hear me preach. But I, when I got there, that they didn't know me. They didn't have any idea who I was, my friend had met my mother at Kroger's. Now, if you shopped at Indicator uh, years ago at Kroger's, you've got to meet my mother. She was Mrs. Kroger's for so many years, 30 years. But my friend heard that i have been doing some preaching and just, he'd never met me. And so he asked my mother to ask me if I'd come preach on their Youth revival. And I went there and they had chairs in the aisles. The choir loft was full. Every seat in the house was full. As I said, it, it was because their revival had been like that every night. And it, as we can say here in Alabama, it near slapped to have scared me to death. And uh, then we went back into a room and they were going to pray with me before we went out to preach. And uh, some of the youth leaders. And their church leaders were back in the pastor's study. They were going to pray with me. And then my friend began to tell me about how to conduct myself for the radio audience. I was going to have to wear a microphone like this. So I was finding out that this was going to be broadcast on WAJF. If I had been frightened before, I was horrified now. It's a wonderful, great, wonderful work of God going on in that church. And I don't I have such a wonderful memory of that, and I shared with you just now the high points. I wish I could tell you that I preached a great message. I know exactly what I preached on, but uh, I was just getting started. And I'm sure it was not a prize. But we went, Terry and I went and joined that church, and strange that somehow there were some people in that church who fell out of favor with our friend, the pastor. I loved him, and I, I didn't worship him, but I, I loved him and his wife dearly, and they were so kind to us. And he taught me so many things. I remember when, before I joined their church, I asked him to come out and meet me 
at a restaurant and I said, I, I want you to teach me some things. I just want you to teach me if you want. I was, I was uh, at that time only about 17, 18 years of age. It was just before Terry and I married. And he said he would. And I loved him. And so there was a, a, a group in the church that fell out of favor with him. And I, I know that he was a human being and he probably made some mistakes. And he may have rubbed, he was a, he was a gruff man. If you know who I'm talking about, you know he's rather gruff and short. To the boys, he had no humor at all. But I began to see something that I had never, well, I guess I can't say I had never seen, but I had seen very little of that. Many in the congregation just simply had no favor for him at all. He made a mistake one Sunday morning that uh, he was talking about the young people, the teenagers in the church, and he said that, he, he said this, he said, this little girl over here has been following this little boy around just like a puppy dog. I've learned a long time ago, don't ever talk to the teenagers from the pulpit. It just, it just never works. <laughs> I, we, were, we were eating out Friday night before last, and a, a young man came up to our table at the restaurant, and he's, he's a grown up young man, and I recognized him immediately. And uh, I met him and his two sisters when Terry and I were serving at the Walden Chapel Baptist Church. And uh, he was just a little bitty fellow. And he had not been in church very much. And I remember one Sunday morning, he, he'd already popped up two or three times to go to the bathroom. And about that third time, he popped up and I knew he, I was preaching. And here, and I just looked at him and I said, sit down, Tyler. And he went, Poof, and just went over and sit down, popped down. He came over and spoke to us at the restaurant Friday night, and then he brought up his wife over, and she's expecting their first baby. And uh, he didn't seem to be too upset with me at all. And uh, he's doing fine. I'm so proud. And I knew that God had him there for me that night to, to encourage me. My friend said, and she's following him around just like a puppy dog. Man, he, he was making an attempt at uh, being humorous. But do you know what everybody, not everybody, you know a lot of people in that church began to say, our pastor called that little girl a dog. From the pulpit, our pastor called that young lady a dog. Well, he didn't do that at all. He didn't do that at all. But it sounds very much like Jesus is calling this woman a dog. Look, she comes and she's just begging him. Now let's look at several things here first of all. They did go to the beach. And it says they entered into a house. Now it doesn't say that it was a house of one of his family members. None of Jesus' family lived in Tyre or Sidon. It doesn't say that he had a friend there or an associate. Probably did very much, maybe like you and I might have done. Whenever you've gone to a place, you just find somebody that has a house that nobody's living in and say, we'll give you a few bucks if you'll just let us stay in your house for a few days. He went into that kind of house. <laughs> it was a condominium down on Tyre and Sidon. Pardon? Airbnb. Yeah, that's right. Jesus said, I want to, let's go eat some seafood. It's got to have scales on it, though. <laughs> that kind of narrow. If you go into the beach and you're going to eat seafood, if you're Jewish, it really narrows down your menu. Yeah, no oysters or shrimp. Or yeah, no oysters or shrimp, no lobsters, and all that creepy curly stuff. And he said, he, right here, Mark says that he wanted no one to know it. There's a lot being said right here. We see this often. I've mentioned this before in preaching in Mark, that anything and everything that Jesus did cost him. It cost him. There was a woman who came and just simply touched him, 
to be healed. And, and he said, who touched me? He said, I felt virtue go out of my body. Can you imagine that every time Jesus healed somebody that it hurt? Have you ever thought about that? That every time Jesus touched somebody, it hurt. He felt it. It, it cost him. And why is Jesus going to the beach? Why is he trying to get away? And here is someone who came to die for everybody in the world. And he says, let's go find some place where there are not any people. And he says he, he didn't want anybody to know. He didn't want anybody to know. I want you to see here in this story that Jesus was tired. And he was weary. <laughs> he was beat up. Well, that was the human part of it. That's exactly right. We know him as God, the Son of God. We know, and yet also, he took upon himself, Paul said, the form of a servant. And he said, let's go to the beach and don't tell anybody I'm there. But he couldn't be hidden, it says. This woman found him. And she came there and just fell at his feet. There's a presumption in all of us. Sometimes we think our parents had a debt to us. It's true. Your mom and your dad owed you something. Certainly parents ought to take care of their children and love their children. Certainly moms and dads ought to do everything they can to love and provide for their children. But any time you or I, as a child, feel that our parents or grandparents owe us something, that's a very, very, very harmful and destructive attitude. That's not gratitude, it's not graciousness. If you look at anybody and you feel a sense that they are obligated to you, if you feel that way about a policeman or a teacher or a coach or any friend or family member that you have a sense of entitlement that this is owed to me. The country or the president or, or uh, the American dream or the society owes me a living or, or they need to pay off my debts or they need to uh, rescue me from harm. They need to feed me and clothe me. Yes, our country and our citizenship and we ourselves we create that very problem we intend for assistance and welfare to be a good thing and so often it is harmful I just want to tell you that if there's anyone that you are offended at or someone that you feel the presumption of here is someone because of who they are and their relationship to me they owe me something. That's very, that's a very, very poor stand. It's, it's not gracious. It's, it's not going to help you in life. It's, it's not beneficial. It is, that is a bad stance, a bad tap. This woman may have felt the way we do about God. And since He's Jesus, He owes me a miracle. Have you ever gotten mad at God because He didn't give you something that you wanted or felt like you needed? Do you feel that God owes you something? If you do, you're mistaken. You're wrong. Now Jesus was a Jewish person, and there were there were in our as there were for him and there are for us cultural norms. There were things that Gentiles were like and Jews were like. In society, there were expectations of people of different nationalities and different cultures. It's not all racism. It's not all discrimination. Sometimes it's just life. 
I like this. It says, the woman, look at verse 26. The woman was a Greek. The woman was a Greek. Now that's very, very funny. This is a word that I can say that this woman was not a Greek at all. Now let me ask you a question, and I want to show you what I'm talking about. If you go into Decatur, and you meet someone from Honduras, or El Salvador, or from Puerto Rico, in Decatur, do you know what we call those people? No, they're Mexicans. They're all Mexicans. You know it. They're Mexicans. Several years ago, a good friend of mine who's a pastor, a mission pastor, among Hispanics, and uh, he was going to teach me Spanish. He's from Colombia. And I said, and he was working as a pastor of a church where everybody in his church were Mexicans. And so I, so I said, okay, so, you know, just, I don't want to make an assumption, but do they speak differently than you? And he said this to me, I remember. He said, Mexicans don't speak Spanish. And I said, well, what do they speak? He said, they speak Mexican. They speak Mexican. This word even appears in Scripture, and it just means they were non-Jewish. Paul uses this word, the New Testament writers, when it says that she was a Greek. It doesn't mean she was from Greece. She was, it says she was born in Syrophoenicia. It means she was a Gentile. What was she? She was a Mexican. <laughs> I know Hispanic people get so tired of that. And someone say, I'm from El Salvador. What? I'm from El Salvador. Where? I'm a Mexican. Oh, okay. Why do you say so? The Bible teaches us very plainly that Jesus came as the Jewish Messiah and he was to present this news about the kingdom of God among the children of Abraham and they were to be get, being given first chance to believe in Jesus. It's very obvious. Paul even says this in Romans 1.16. He says, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God and the salvation to the Jew first and also to the Greek. You see, to the Jew first and then the Mexicans. Hmm. I always figured maybe Greek was a short way of saying Gentiles. Saying what? Saying Gentiles. Yes, it's Gentiles. Non-Jewish non people, non-circumcised people. And that didn't mean that they spoke Greek or they were from Greece. They're just Mexicans. Now, Jesus said, let the children first be free. He said, hey, wait, it, it's not right to take food away from the, your children around the table and give it to the dogs. Well, Jesus was just calling her a dog. Well, no, he wasn't at all. No doubt, Jesus' detractors would have said this because when you hate somebody, you hate everything they say. You hate everything they do. And I've seen that happen. I've seen Christian people fall out of favor with someone and they hate everything they do. I've seen people just despise church leaders, spiritual leaders. They've fallen out of favor and everything they say and everything they do, they hate makes no sense at all. Let's look at that next slide, Carter, let's finish up. This woman had a very quick wit, and she wasn't offended at all. And she didn't, you see, I mentioned this to you in a message several weeks ago. You can't really offend someone. It's impossible to offend someone. You know, the proper use of that word is when someone takes offense. He took offense. You can't offend someone. You have to take offense. You have to decide to be offended. This woman decided that she wasn't offended. 
And it, if you could see this, I believe that this woman and this and Jesus, they were looking at each other pleasantly. And they were smiling. And they were having a tete-a-tete. -tete. They, were, they were having a conversation. Jesus was tired, and yet he knew how this was going to turn out. She popped up and she said, yeah, but even, in Rock, even Roxy and Winston get the crumbs on the floor. And Jesus said, that's right. We had two little pugs that grew up in the mule home, and they loved to, they would eat. They would step, sit right up underneath my granddaughter's high chair because they were messy eaters. And one of them always sat next to me because he knew that I would give him food. My daughter didn't want me to, but I did anyway. And I don't regret that. I don't think it uh, precipitated his demise. Sometimes, if I wasn't quick enough, he would bark at me. Mm -hmm. Woo! Okay, okay. Just a minute. What do you want? I saw a video on TikTok recently where someone was eating Chinese and they took some chopsticks and they picked up a, a, an egg roll or something like that, held it out to the dog, and the dog just looked at him like that. Like, and he just said, Here. He said, okay, he, so he, he, he dipped it in some sauce, then he gave the dog, and the dog gave it. Do we think I'm going to eat that without sauce on it? <laughs> so we got a dummy. <laughs> when we were at the beach, uh, there, I, I don't remember any interruptions much, uh, especially nobody came for demons to be cast out. But, uh, Jesus was simply saying, there's, there's a right way and a proper way of doing things. And that's God's way. And yet, I want you to see something right here. I'm, I mean, this might be the point of the message. Jesus was saying, this is the way this should be done. And we're, we're just going to try to observe the protocol. Jesus was always willing to dodge the rules and the regulations and the traditions and societal norms in order to help somebody. There are some proclivities that I have. There are some priorities that I have. There are some personal preferences that I have. And I'm not talking about the scripture, or the commandments of God, or the law of the Lord. I'm talking about some things that are part of my culture, part of my... I have a certain way that I like for things to be. Jesus had those things too. He mentioned it to this woman. And, and then he said, I'll tell you what. I'm going to go around that. I'm going to skirt that. I'm going to go over it. I'm going to go under it. We're going to figure out a way to help you. There was even a time when... Religious leaders brought a woman to Jesus and said, this woman is an adulteress and the Old Testament law of Moses says that she should be stoned to death. Jesus found a way to save that woman's life. He, he found a way without disobeying the scripture, without uh, subverting the law of Moses, he found a way to save that woman's life. And that's what he is all about. There may be things that you prefer, things that you like, things that you enjoy, and things that are kind of like a a standard in your life. But if you see an opportunity to help somebody, then be like Jesus. Help them. If you can, there are many times when I want to help somebody and I can't. Jesus told this woman, look that last slide there, or this one more slide. So often I begin my prayers by saying, Lord, you don't owe me anything. Lord, you don't owe me anything. You've already done more for me than I deserve. I'm not asking you for help or I'm not asking you for anything because I deserve it or because for any other reason other than the fact that I just need it. I never ask the Lord for anything because I feel like he's obligated you listen to all of these health, wealth, and wisdom preachers, and they say, you know, if you get this verse of Scripture and kind of get the Lord up in a hammerlock, He has to answer that prayer because you're believing in faith and you're using that verse of Scripture. And 
And I'd have to tell them, uh huh. He doesn't owe you nothing. He doesn't owe you anything. And if he wants to help you, he will. But it won't be because he owes it to you. He paid a debt he did not owe. I owed the debt that I could not pay. I needed someone. I needed someone to wash my sins away. That's what grace is. And this woman understood. I don't think she ruined Jesus' vacation. He certainly, he certainly made her day. Certainly made her day. She went on. Her little girl was well. And all he had to do was just speak it. Go on. Go on home. Your daughter's fine. He can do that. He can do that. I don't understand why he doesn't do it to everybody. Why he doesn't heal everybody's daughter, everybody's son. I don't know why he didn't just speak about it. He doesn't know what's that. It's not a failure on his part that he doesn't solve all problems of the world. People say, well, there's so many things wrong in the world. You mean you still believe in God? A God didn't create those problems. He didn't make those things happen. Most of the things that I suffer in my life are of my doing. And not, God is not to blame at all. He does not owe me fixing what I have messed up. Lord Jesus, thank you for all that you've done for me. You've already done more than I deserve. Who am I? Who am I? I am nothing. I am dust. I do not begin my prayers, Lord Jesus, by saying, what have you done for me lately? What will you do for me today? To say, Lord, here am I. Send me. What can I do for you? I can never repay you. You owe me nothing. Teach me about your spirit, Lord. And when I get weary too, if there's not a beach close by or a handy at all, show me how I can be refreshed in you. For I ask it, Lord Jesus, in your name. Amen. Brother Danny, what's our hymn of invitation today? Hymn number 233. Number 233. Let's go.